The United Brotherhood of Carpenters ICRA programs are a result of years of research, collaboration, and development with healthcare professionals and contractors throughout the United States, and are offered at no cost with nearly 100,000 professionals completing the various programs since 2007. With one shared vision, this collaboration is helping to protect patients from secondary infections and illnesses during construction and renovation projects. If you would like to join the growing list of UBC ICRA training partnerships, please visit www.ubc-icra.org. You're listening to The Five Second Rule, brought to you by APIC, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. Together with our nearly 16,000 members, we strive to create a safer world through the prevention of infection. Join us while we talk to infection preventionists and other experts to learn the truth about some common myths related to the risk of infection and to get tips to keep yourself and the people around you safe from infection. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of APIC's The Five Second Rule. I'm Sylvia Quevedo, your host, and I know I say this all the time, but we have a great show for you today. You'll, uh, you'll be surprised to learn all the amazing things around infection prevention and control considerations with renovation and construction. That's right. It's not your house. It's not your kitchen or your bathroom, but hospitals and other healthcare facilities also from time to time have to renovate, fix things. Uh, And then, of course, it's always exciting to build from scratch. So today we're going to talk to two folks who know a lot about this. We have with us today Linda Dickey, who happens to be the Senior Director of Epidemiology and Infection Prevention at the University of California, Irvine Health. And she also happens to be the 2021 President-Elect for APIC. She's done a lot of great things for the last 15 years, including teaching uh, for the American Society for Healthcare Engineering. She's done a lot of courses there. So welcome, Linda Dickey. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Really appreciate the opportunity. You are joined by Jason Karras, who's the business representative and the ICRA coordinator for the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. And he is a union carpenter with 23 years of experience and a proud member of the UBC, which is the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners of America. Welcome, Jason. Oh, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. I appreciate it. Wow, that's a mouthful. My goodness. I don't think I've heard (laughs) too much about that, but I'm going to ask you about it. But before I delve into this episode, which stay with us, folks, this is really kind of cool. ICRA, to be clear, is Infection Control Risk Assessment. Infection Control Risk Assessment. But we're going to keep saying ICRA because that's that's a mouthful, but just so folks know what we're talking about. Okay. So, Linda, let's let's get started. I, I don't think the average public, the average person understands all of what goes in to reno- doing renovation at a healthcare facility. And so that's what we want to highlight. And we also want to talk to our other healthcare worker colleagues and infection preventionists to sort of understand what goes into this and what their role is and what we need to be concerned about. So I'm going to start with you and say, talk to us a little bit about what are some of the key infection control risks associated when, you know, a facility says, hey, we got to redo this this wall or we've got to do an add-on. Talk to us a little bit about some of the general concerns um, that folks may not be aware of. So, yeah, uh, in, uh, renovation and construction in healthcare is uh, unique uh, because there are um, germs in the environment that live in dust and um, whether it's dust Um, behind the ceilings that need to be taken down or the walls. Um, There are um, organisms as well that live in water that might be stagnant for a period of time when we perform uh, work in a space and have to turn the plumbing off. 
So there are ways to do it safely, uh, but we uh, have to manage it very carefully when we do those types of projects, particularly around patients um, or spaces like the pharmacy or other areas that may serve patients. Uh, we have to take these types of um, considerations that we think about during a, a risk assessment and, um, into um, consideration. Okay, so with that, of course, you know, and as you're talking, uh, I certainly recall back when I was involved in direct clinical care, you know, parts of the hospital or the outpatient with those plastic, you know, or a room cut off. And I'm also thinking of, you know, anybody who's listening to us right now who's ever done renovation in their, you know, their kitchen or their house. It's, you know, it's a mess and you got to plan for it well ahead of, you know, the first. I guess, hammer coming down. So let me ask you this, Linda. Are infection preventionists routinely involved in the planning of a renovation or construction project? It has gotten better over the years. Uh, when we first started seeing evidence coming out in the literature, and this was um, you know, over 20 years ago, of um, linking construction projects and renovation projects to infections occurring among patients. Uh, infection prevention was not uh, at the table, uh, but over time, I think that we all became more aware of the risks involved with these activities and infection preventionists uh, more and more often are be becoming involved. I would say the gap that we have um, we do have some facilities that, that don't engage their infection preventionists as much as they could. We definitely have a long way to go in terms of engaging infection preventionists even earlier during the design of these spaces, which is obviously not the focus of today's show, but, but um, during the renovation and construction, it has gotten better. And would you say that the, and I'm going to say it, you know, the average sort of, if you think about all of our 16,000 members who are infection preventionists across the United States, urban, rural, et cetera, would you say that this is an area that an infection preventionist feels comfortable sort of stepping in? Or, uh, you know, talk to us about how much do you, how comfortable, let me put it that way, how comfortable do you uh, think, and again, I know you can't speak for 16,000 people, but I'm going to ask you to, <laughs> how comfortable, uh, you know, are infection preventionists when they, you know, join that team to talk about renovation? Yeah, it's, or, a, it's a very good question. I, I think it's something that people have to learn because uh, whether our discipline is nursing, such as mine, or microbiology, or public health, people do not come into infection prevention knowing the things like that Jason would know through working in the, in the industry or an engineer would know uh, or a facility manager who runs a, a building and understands um, the, the actual function and operation of a, a building. So, um, you know, there are obviously um, courses and things. Um, there are ways that an infection preventionist can become more educated but much of it is also learned by partnering with other disciplines to see how a building is put together, learn how construction projects, the different phases, um, and also, you know, reading the literature and, and learning from, from um, what's already happened before to find out how infections have occurred so that when you do an infection prevention risk assessment, infection control risk assessment, that um, those things can be avoided. So, of course, you know, I am a shameless plugger here on the five second rule. And um, to that point, Linda, and for those infection preventionists out there, and even if you're not an infection preventionist, maybe you're a healthcare worker, maybe you're a tech, um, APIC does have a great book called Infection Prevention Manual for Construction and Renovation. So it's a great book. And it does sort of outline what you, you started to talk about, you know, what is it that you need to know when you're stepping into that team? Jason, I'm going to turn to you. Um, talk to us about, you know, your role and how you've worked with infection preventionists. Absolutely. Be happy to. Um, so as you mentioned in my introduction, I am the uh, ICRA coordinator for our regional council area, and that covers uh, Minnesota, 
Iowa, North, South Dakota, Wisconsin, and Nebraska. And over the past, well, I'd say <clears throat> six to seven years, we have developed a very strong uh, relationship with the uh, APIC uh, chapter in our area. And um, it's really become a partnership. Um, to kind of go back to your question as I was li listening to uh, Linda answer, um, a lot of IPs in my experience um, that I've met, that I've talked to, um, sometimes they're uh, a little uncomfortable having those discussions with uh, contractors or facility staff or whoever might be doing a renovation project at their facility um, because they, they don't understand um, the way a construction project um, is, is phased or the different processes, tools, you know, the results of using certain tools are going to apply to uh, that, you know, said project. So um, the relationship that we've built here has been phenomenal. Um, it, it's really been uh, a win-win for, for everyone involved and most importantly, uh, the patients in the facility. Most important. And you know, let's just be honest. It's always a win-win with APIC. Um, but mm -hmm. I want to get to some specifics. Um, so, okay, we've established that, listen, you've got to be collaborating with your infection preventionists. And if you are an infection preventionist, you really want to get comfortable, you know, go to APIC.org, get the book, talk to your colleagues. But really, it is a partnership with others. And there are phases. We, we heard that. Um, so, Jason, I, I'm, you know, I'm a lay person here and I, I don't even live in a house. I'm in an apartment. I call the super if there's a problem. So just know that. But we're talking about a plan. There are phases, as Linda indicated, you, you know, the risk around uh, disrupting um, materials, dust flying in the air, uh, ensuring that there's adequate uh, ventilation, that there's adequate... Um, safety, just basic safety, that people aren't tripping over things. Um, so I, I want to get to um, an interesting activity that took place uh, at one of the APIC annual conferences where there was this great collaboration with the Carpenters Union. And Jason, I want to ask you, can you describe what took place sort of generally? Um, and then I'm going to ask you guys um a little bit more about that, but talk to us, share with the audience what that was. Sure. I'm happy to. That was, um, you're referring to the APIC national conference in Philadelphia in 2019. Um, we partnered, uh, the UBC partnered with APIC and this is kind of <clears throat> the, the simulated hospital that we had, um, at the conference center, um, was a tool that we used to kind of um, open the eyes of infection preventionists of, of certain ways that, um, you know, construction activities happen in their facility. And, and what it was, was there was, there was a couple rows of patient rooms. Um, there was a, a, one of the patient rooms would simulate, you know, the proper way to, uh, contain contaminants, do the pro um, project that they were the workers were doing. And then next to that, there would be the wrong way that that things are done. So we got a lot of chuckles out of the attendees. Um, but you know, in all seriousness, um, what what that uh, simulator does is it it brings an awareness. It, it really kind of opened the eyes of of some of the attendees that may not have the uh, opportunity to work with, um, you know, contractors or, or trades that really do care about what's happening in that facility. And then again, on the same note, there are a lot of great contractors out there that are doing the right thing to protect the patients, keep the IPs involved. So that's what that, that UBC APIC hospital was all about. So it was um, a recreation of a hospital where you had it was, it looked like a hospital. There were people there and you created a scenario and in some scenarios it was correct. And in others it wasn't. And so then, um, people had to determine which was correct, which wasn't, or find 
you know, sort of find the problem or what's wrong with this picture. If, if those of you listening have ever done that. Um, so what were some of the things, um, um, Linda, were you there at that one? I was, it was very well done. Uh, I have to say that, um, the example, they had several examples that were, um, just, you know, very common examples that you would see for, uh, like, um, wet materials. Uh, you know, we often, We'll speak about how important it is to keep materials um, clean and dry. Um, and you wouldn't think of that typically as an infection prevention risk, but it is. So they demonstrated something like that. They demonstrated um, how you can um, lose effective pressurization. So the, the uh, dusty, dirty air uh, for a space should be moving towards the construction zone, not out towards the patients. And they were able to demonstrate um, you know, something like that. And they were also able to demonstrate, you know, some other really basic things like the, just the cleanliness of a space. If you've got a, uh, a space where people are throwing debris into the walls instead of collecting it and putting it in a, in a rubbish bin, or, you know, just aren't keeping a space clean, that's going to collect um, or attract uh, um, bugs and um, it, it can cause decay in the walls. And so, you know, you want your construction play, uh, space to be clean. And I think that the Carpenters Union did a, a really nice job of illustrating um, some really basic things that actually still do happen uh, after all these years of, of, of training. Um, we still do see some of those errors and, and they illustrated it brilliantly. I remember that there was, like you said, Linda and, and Jason, there were some basic things like, oh, the guys are eating their lunch and they left, you know, the candy wrapper there. Or as you also indicated, um, you know, there might be a mop and a, you know, or a tool laying out where someone could trip. Um, the other uh, couple of common examples that I think anybody, even if you've done this in your house, have related to is, again, the dust and ensuring that that is clean, certainly afterwards. Um, I want to go back to the dry, wet. That's a big theme in the five second rule because we know that microbes love moisture. They're, you know, and warmth, kind of like us, right? So, um, so that is so key when an infection prevention is, is, is looking at a space is, you know, is it clean? Is it dry? Is there moisture potential that could, um, support microbial growth? So I, I do want to go back to that. And then I also want to go back to ventilation. And I think, you know, more and more as a healthcare worker, you know, you need to understand that. But I think people even going through a global pandemic, um, when we hear about, um, not in healthcare, but even, you know, just terrible stories around, you know, mold and what's happening in a space. Um, so I want to go back to that. Um, Linda, can you explain a little bit more about this notion of wet, dry? Are we talking about the mop or are we talking about, what are we talking about? Sure. So one of the primary concerns is that you don't want materials going into your, um, uh, actual construction that are, are wet. And drywall is a great example. Um, it can mold later. Um, so, you know, it takes a while for a building to be closed in, for it to have windows and not um, have moisture come in. Uh, typically, you don't start seeing those types of materials being put into place until a building is, is closed in. But even in the interim, when um, some of those other materials are being brought in and, and the HVAC unit, the, the um, unit itself is a great example. You want the ductwork, the inside of the ductwork to be dry. You want the unit to stay nice and clean and dry. So um, many times those items will come from the manufacturer covered and that's best practice. And th those are the kinds of things that your eyes will get trained to, to look for. Um, but what the Carpenters Union also did a very nice job um, demonstrating, and Jason can speak to this better than I can, is that they do a splendid job of building barriers um, to help keep a space, um, you know, free of dust or to confine dust. And those same barriers can help if you've got, um, you know, certain types of um, moisture issues from the outside. You can um, use those in an, in an interim way. Um, 
The other issue or challenge with, with uh, moisture is that you can have um, an, an, an event or an accident happen during the construction. A sprinkler head can get knocked off, um, something of that nature. And so responding to those things quickly and taking out materials if they've already been put into place so that you're not just um, you know, accepting that down the road is, is critical as well. Jason, do you want to add to that? Sure. Um, you know, Linda brought up a, a great point about materials being covered. Um, you know, typically um, with any uh, copper tubing for your, your plumbing assemblies or ductwork, uh, they should be coming into the space as needed, um, usually off shift. Um, one rule of thumb that we've always practiced uh, when I was working in the field was that um, day's material for day's work. We didn't want to uh, stockpile our materials in a construction space for the exact reasons that uh, Linda brought up. You could bust a sprinkler head and I've, I've seen it and it um, it's not a good sight and it doesn't smell great. <laughs> so um, that's one thing to be aware of. But as far as the uh, temporary barriers, um, there's several different key factors that you have to look at. Is it uh, a barrier that is um, maybe on the other side of that barrier, we're building uh, a rated corridor wall? Well, the temporary barrier needs to be rated. Is it what up does against that mean, a rated corridor? Sure. Great question. I, I apologize. Um, that's my construction coming out of me. Uh, rated, fire rated. Um, so uh, typically corridors, uh, you know, when you're walking down the main corridors of, or a hallway in a facility, um, they're rated. They're usually a, a one or two hour rating. Oh, um, I see. Okay. So it's a rating from. Yeah. It's a, like a life a, safety issue. I see. I see. Like the national fire protection agency that sets those. Yep. Yep. So okay. that would be a reference to uh, NFPA 101, the life safety code. Um. And, you know, if we have a barrier, say we have an addition to a facility um, and we have to do what we call a tie in, that's where we're tying in the new addition to the existing building. We have to be aware of uh, obviously the weather, moisture, um, dust, contaminants. Uh, one thing that uh, I'd like to mention about drywall is a lot of times those are that material is stored in. Um, usually it's not environmentally controlled. So it could be in a, a shed, in a layup yard. Uh, hopefully it's wrapped in plastic, so on and so forth. So whenever construction materials are introduced to moisture, it's not only the dust, uh, as Linda had mentioned, um, there could be bird droppings. Mm. You, you know, there, there's like different those. factors to really uh, look at and pay attention to uh, when introducing materials um, into, the, into the new space. Well, for sure, nobody and likes bird droppings. <laughs> I'll just add to that um, comment about birds um, or other types of, of animals that they they can get into a construction space, mm -hmm. you know, before it's closed up or if doors are propped open, and um, and that can cause you know problems. Um, so you know the the issues that arise from an infection prevention standpoint can really be quite varied. Um, the other aspect that we find challenging is when you have to turn off uh, utilities uh, for a construction or renovation. And that would include plumbing and HVAC, um, sometimes having to orchestrate that to allow for continued care um, around the construction zone or adjacent to can be a challenge, but we obviously can't, we're not always in a position to be able to completely shut down the hospital or even shut down a unit when we have to get construction done. So um, that can also introduce some challenges um, that we have to think through very carefully and orchestrate with our um, partners um, in you know, facilities and um, the contractor. Oh my God, there's so much to think about. So I wanna go back to a couple of things. One, and this is sort of just, okay, I'm curious about this. Why do they call it drywall if it can get moldy? <laughs> Well, I, so it's, it's gypsum board. 
Um, I mean, I know I'm not the only person who's wondering that. So Right. So the reason why it's called drywall, and some of my colleagues might give me a heck of a time for, for this, but um, back in the day, back, um, I would say pre-1960, 1950, a lot of construction of, you know, your finished interior walls was plaster. So that's a, that's a wet substance. It's like, um, I don't know if you've ever done plaster of Paris. Oh yeah. I lived in a building that's turn of the century that had plaster walls. Yeah. Yeah. So that's all mixed on site with water. Um, and then it's spread over lath and then it's smoothed out and finished. Well, when you have gypsum board or drywall that comes pre, you know, um, formed and you just, you screw it to the, to the studs. So. I'm assuming that's where the it's name called came called drywall from. because it's different than the old plaster that was made with liquid. Is that sort of? Right. Yeah. The, the old style got smeared on with trowels and finished on site. Okay. Bit of a so. misnomer, but I, I know others are wondering about that. Sure. Here's my other question, Linda, to your point, And I know obviously patients have to get moved before this all happens. So there's this incredible logistical planning, I'm sure that happens to get patients moved away to the, to the extent possible. Um, and then you just mentioned some of the challenges around navigating utilities. As an infection preventionist, how do you work with other healthcare staff, you know, frontline clinical providers on managing this. Can you talk us through a little bit about that? Do you, do you find that they're, you know, compliant? Do you have to do a lot of education? Uh, well, we get a lot of good collaboration, at least at, at my organization. We've had uh, a fantastic history of, of co- collaboration around our renovation and construction projects. Um, but I can give you a couple of examples. So, um, let's say, for example, you were doing a renovation um, in a location that had an air handler that served um, airborne infection isolation rooms, which are rooms that we would typically use for tuberculosis or measles, you know, airborne diseases. And um, that air handler might serve both those rooms and then other, um, you know, regular patient rooms that are not engineered for particular specialty airflow. And if you have to turn that uh, unit off for a tie-in, as Jason had mentioned earlier, or some sort of work um, on the HVAC system, you're going to have to communicate with the nursing unit that may, you know, may have an infectious patient in those rooms on another floor, because again, we're talking about a shared air handler. Um, You're going to have to coordinate with your facility director or manager um, about the timing of that. So there, there are, um, there are such, you know, specific types of challenges that can come up like that. Another example might be, uh, you might have an area where you're doing renovation and you're going to have to turn the water off for, for several weeks or even months. And, um, so you have to think about, uh, do you have uh, dead legs where that water is sitting in that plumbing for a long period of time? And is, is it going to grow biofilm? If so, how are we going to address that to make sure when we start using that space again, that we've flushed it thoroughly, treated the pipes, make sure that everything is good to go so it's a safe space. So those are just two very basic examples of how um, utility systems can interface with infection prevention challenges and how we work together you know, within within the organization and also with our contracting partners. Yeah, we have a whole other episode on Legionella and what goes on in those pipes. That's our episode 14. Um, Let me ask you this, Jason, um, do you and your colleagues and the Carpenters Union um, and other contractors, uh, do you work with the, uh, just talk to us about what your understanding is of your personal protection in terms of walking into a health space. Do you get some sort of briefing around how you as a, as a person have to protect yourself uh, from any potential microbes? Yep, absolutely. So um, the UBC has two courses, uh, one for our members, and it, 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 um, it's a 24-hour best practices, and it's 16 hours of intensive classroom training 
Um, and it talks about pathogens, what we might be exposed to, how do we con conduct ourselves professionally within a healthcare system. We require our members um, to go through this training um, so they can be prepared to work in your spaces. Um, the last day, the first, like I mentioned, the first 16 hours is classroom. And then the last day, the eight hour training is on a shop floor at one of our 200 training facilities across the US and Canada. Um, erecting barriers, setting up negative air, uh, learning about isolation rooms, um, going through the ICRA permit process. So that's one thing I wanted to bring up is the infection control risk assessment is exactly um, what it states. It's a risk assessment. And what Linda was talking about earlier was steps nine and 10 of that assessment. Um, the one thing that is extremely important is to work directly with your infection preventionist and the team at the facility. And that's one thing that we, uh, we, we, we teach our members and, and we talk to them about, you know, different hazards or exposures. So working in a healthcare facility is actually a privilege. Um, it's a lot different. Well, it's extremely different than a normal construction site. Um, we get asked this question a lot. Well, we ask our members this question a lot. What's the difference between, you know, the parking garage that you're building downtown and working at a hospital? Well, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious to me. Um, there's patients and there's lives involved. So there's specialized training for each situation. Um, so that's why the UBC has developed a couple of these training programs. We also have an eight-hour training, which is an awareness for infection preventionists and other traits so that we can all be on the same page and work cohesively. Very so it's cool. extremely important. Very and important. Makes a really good point is that the infection control risk assessment is by definition intended to be multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not um, something that everybody, you know, each discipline does in isolation. We should do it together because we learn from each other. And certainly as an infection preventionist, I'm not going to recognize all the risks that a particular um, job might present. But um, together with the contractor and the, you know, the various disciplines, we can understand uh, from each other's point of view so that we can put together a plan based on the risk assessment that will keep patients safe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we hear a lot about that. There's a lot of great information out there on uh, the ICRA. I mean, I don't know. I, I, ad I'm a, I admit, I'm a bit of a geek. I love this stuff. There's so much to think about. I think, you know, the public, other healthcare workers, certainly even other, you know, carpenters and, and um, contractors, infection preventionists. I mean, there's so much that goes into the risk and what happens during construction, all the moving parts in healthcare. I mean, my God, we could just do, you know, one show on ventilation, but, and maybe we will. Um, but honestly, I, I love this stuff and I, I think it's important for everybody to know about it. And so I cannot thank you enough, Linda Dickey and Jason Karras for your, your time and your expertise and sharing uh, your knowledge. And I know that at APIC, we are certainly looking forward to, you know, collaborating again with the Carpenters Union and hopefully recreating some of those uh, hospitals or even, you know, maybe we'll do long-term care. Maybe we'll do, you know, an outpatient setting or a dentist's office or whatever. Um, lots of potential. Um, and with that, just a friendly reminder to check out www.apic.org and to check out some of the, the materials uh, on this very subject. Thanks for listening to The Five Second Rule, produced by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology staff, including Sylvia Covedo and the APIC Communications Committee, in partnership with Human Factor. Audio tech is Blake Alfin.